at this point, then justice is now the name of the new dispensation. And it is in the dispensation of justice that God intends to put every enemy of Christ under his feet. So we have a change from the things that are to the things that will be after or thereafter. I, I want you to see that the vision, two visions that John has had before uh, have bring us up to this time of tribulation. And that this setting of the throne of justice in the heavens is prerequisite. It introduces, it's the vanguard for the tribulation period. It is the time of things that happen hereafter. It is the time that Jesus comes out of the Holy of Holies. It is the time that he spews the remaining church out of his mouth, the Laodicean spirit. It is the time that God will put all of the enemies under his feet. This, this is what we're looking at in these first few verses of chapter 4. It's that transition from the things that are to the things that will happen hereafter. And the things that will happen hereafter are or a short time span wherein we have found the things that are have run 2,000 years. Thus, but this period that we're now speaking of is limited, and God has limited it to two, three and a half year periods. So once this throne is set, that opens the door and sets the clock for the last seven years before the actual coming back of Christ. This throne is set in the heavens. It's not set on the earth. It's not the glorious throne of God, of Christ nor God. This is the throne of justice on which God has prepared for his son to occupy and to administer justice to the whole world. Not only to the world, but to those of the church that are remaining on the earth that now must endure. Not only to the church remaining on the earth that now must endure, but to Israel. Not only to Israel and the church that's remaining on the earth, but to the whole entire wicked world. Not only to those three, but also to Satan. So the justice goes the whole gambit. The whole, the, all the groups of beings that are left in the inhabited world are now to be judged by Jesus Christ. The time has arrived. God declares justice to be administrated. The grace dispensation is ending. Grace meaning the divine influence upon the heart to be called into the new creation, new covenant, new man calling of the heavenly ruling and reigning with Christ for the millennial period. That, that particular administration is is called or dispensation is called by by grace and mercy it's ending the gospel of this covenant is over and the day of vengeance in just judgment begins that's what we're seeing here in these first few verses the beginnings of what God intends in those seven years there's an, there's an old covenant psalm that I thought was a Appropriate here. Let me read it to you. It's Psalms 96, 11 through 13. It says, Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice before Jehovah, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. This is, this is the uh, prophetic word as it relates to Jehovah, Yahweh, coming coming as, in, as it relates to this throne being set up that Daniel saw and called him the Ancient of Days that John calls uh, a God. It is, that, it is to that this word speaks in Psalms. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon his throne of his glory. 
And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another. So there we have a, 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 a differentiation for us as it relates to this throne of justice and the throne of glory. We, we are going to bring out in the book of Revelations that there's actually, this is not the right way to say it, but it's the way that I get my point across. There are two comings, right? There's two comings of Christ. One coming uh, is that Christ comes. This is the earth. This is Christ. This is represented with a cross. Christ, he comes to the, he comes in the Perusia, he comes in the clouds, or he comes into that, heavens, the heavens above to, with the Father in this portable, mobile throne. And we'll see that it's portable and mobile and that it's been on the earth before. You remember Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel chapter 10, <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 20-something, Ezekiel 40-something. Uh, we see, and in Isaiah, we see <clears throat> the same picture of this very same thing John saw as far as the seraphim or the cherubim, the six-winged, four-winged uh, 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 beings, and this wheel in a wheel, the fiery wheels. We see this as this mobile, we'll call it the tribunal uh, of justice, the, tri the mobile tribunal of justice. In other words, it's a throne that, that God has that is mobile, that is moved to and fro from where he is, which is heaven, right? <clears throat> what we refer to as heaven, and it is the third heaven, okay? But let me say it now, and I'll say it again later. The third heaven is eternal. That is to mean that it has been here. It is not created, is it? God is not created. He is eternal, and, he's a, and He is a being eternal. And wherever He has eternally been and is, is where He is now. Okay? And it's uncreated, right? So if it's uncreated, it's outside, external to the created. Are you following me? So we refer to it like it's one, two, three, three heavens. But in reality, a scriptural, pr practical reality, heaven, that place, that firmament that God exists in being at, where there is a throne, his glorious throne, is external from where we're at. In other words, you have to pass out of the, of the creation to get into that that is eternal. Can you see that in your mind's eye? It's, it's, it's not one, two, three, like it's just moving from here to there. You have not only to move from here to there, you have to move out of here into there. Because you're a part of creation, and creation's material, and it has a beginning and an end. Everything in this creation has a beginning and an end. But eternity, where God exists and His throne exists, is it's eternal, and it never was created. It always has been, and will always will be. So it's not a part of creation. So it doesn't go one, two, three. So not only is Christ coming back, Twice he's coming back, he's coming back from and out of eternity into time or into creation. Does that make any sense? I don't want to make this really complicated, but it, I think it serves us well to understand that when Christ comes back, he's coming back to creation out of eternity. It's not like there's no communication. There's tons of communication. It's not like there's no a movement back and forth between created and eternal because that's going on all the time, every day, all day, every night. 
it's going on all the time. But it isn't a one, two, three part. Heaven where God is, is eternal. Heaven where Christ is right now at the right hand of the Father is eternal. And he's coming back, and he's coming back into the heavens of the earth. There's the heaven, third heaven, the eternal. Then there's the heavens that surround the earth. He's coming back to the heavens that surround the earth first, and that is where this vision is located. It's located in the heavens above the earth. It's not in heaven, the eternal place. See? It's mobile. If you read Ezekiel, we haven't got time. If you want to read Ezekiel for other, another example, Isaiah is another example, where God comes in this same glorious kind of vision, and Ezekiel sees him, and he actually sees him in Jerusalem, doesn't he? He actually sees this in Jerusalem, and he sees it move from Jerusalem out of Israel, and he sees it move up and out. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's not too dissimilar from that same experience that the prophet had who went out of here in a flaming chariot. It's not too much different from that. But this, it seems in picture, in visuals, in scriptural pictures that are painted here by these prophets, that the, the cherubim are the gasoline of this engine. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're the ones that, that move. When, they, when the Spirit moves them, the throne moves. Wherever the Spirit moves, the throne moves the cherubim, and they go hand in hand. The wheels of fire and the, and the cherubim all in unison move at the throne of God, and they... God sits on the throne. God sits on this throne, this tribunal. You know, tribunal meaning a, a gathering together of one, at least one judge or other than one judge to, to look at judicial matters, to come to a just decision. So this is a tribunal. This is not the throne of God. That's, it's a great, I think it's important to recognize what's going on here. This is not a vision into the holy of holies in the heaven where God is eternal. This is a vision of that that Ezekiel saw, this tribunal throne that's operated by the cherubim that, are, that are accompanying them to this heavenly place, to the heavens within the, within the created arena. Let's call this the created arena, the universe. It's all created. And we, we understand it's expanding, okay? But that doesn't affect the eternal heaven. The heaven is not expanding. Heaven is every, outside and is infinite outside of the created world. I don't want to get off, way off, off with there, but it's, it's very exciting to me to pursue down those roads. But anyway, the vision that John is seeing as we're being introduced to in chapter 4 is, is a throne that's being set up. It's being prepared. It's not eternal. It has a beginning and it has an end. The beginning is when God says, okay, it's time, Jesus. I'm going to put all your enemies under your feet. Let's go. That's when we see this uh, things that will happen hereafter. Now, the throne of his glory stands apart from that, even though it may be this particular throne, but it is something different from this throne in that it is called his, the Lord Jesus' throne of glory that he's been given by the Father. So it's different than the throne of justice, the throne of righteousness, that the throne of judgment that we're looking at through John's eyes now. The throne of justice completing its purposes has been overthrown. The throne of Satan on the earth. The throne of justice completing its purposes has then overthrown the throne of Satan on the earth and in the heavens. Do we know that Satan has a throne? I think we read that in, uh, in uh, Pergamon. Yeah, in, and it was in the second chapter of Revelation. We read that 
they are seated where Satan's throne is so on the earth. So Satan has a, more than one throne. He has a throne in the heaven place. He's the God of the, the air. He has a throne in the heavenly places in the earth, around the earth. And he is the power of the air. And, and he has one on the earth. And we'll see that this throne of justice that's being set now, it hasn't been set yet, but will be set in the future. When it's set, Satan knows his time's short. Because correspondingly, at, at the least three and a half years, and maybe immediately, I not, haven't, haven't discovered the timing here. I'm looking, I'm asking God for the timing. But what Satan does know at the point that Christ comes out of the Holy of Holies from heaven and comes to the heavens above the earth, and this throne is being established in his realm, in the created realm, he knows his time is short. He prepares for a spiritual, heavenly, heavenly being the heavens above the earth battle that we find in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. So when this is happening, when it does happen, then we know that is the prelude. That's the beginning of the destruction and the overthrow of Satan's thrones, both on the earth and that that's in the heavens. And that's in Revelation Oh, it, I had wrote it here. Revelation 2.13 with 12, 8, and 9. Those are two references to his thrones, two thrones. One in the heavens. One in the heavens above the earth in created time space. Not in the heaven out in eternity where God's throne is. That is not where his throne, Satan's throne is. It is in the created realm. Just as his throne on the earth is in the created realm... So his throne in the heavenly place is in the created realm. That's significant because as we move forward, we need to have that understanding as to what is happening throughout these descriptions of the vision. Jesus Christ, are you, is everybody with me? The Jesus Christ, the Messiah, shall reign upon his throne of glory over the earth and the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. That's also a quote from Daniel chapter 7. It's 18 through 27. We read 9 through 11, I believe, and now this is 18 through 27. So at this, the end result was read by Carl in that he said he saw in Daniel the destruction of the Antichrist, that he was consumed and thrown into the fire. What we see then in leading up, or that, that proceeds after that, is this taking and establishing of the kingdom of Christ in glory and him giving the authority that was Satan's and the Antichrist, and the false prophets, giving the authority both in heaven and on the earth to what, what uh, Daniel described as the, the saints of the Most High. What I am doing at the moment is just giving you the, the, the consistency of the Word of God that the God of the Old Covenant is the God of the New Covenant. The God of Daniel is the God of John that the stories are, are the same, that the, the visions are the same, and even though they're different uh, in different times and covenants, they're still applicable and appropriate. And God gives the old covenant prophet and the new covenant prophet the same vision so that he can parallel and, and put together and tie together both of the covenants uh, moving forward in the next seven years that will usher in all of the old covenant prophetic words, fulfill all the old covenant promises to Abraham, to David, uh, to Jesus, to the believers, uh, will fulfill all of those promises that he has given will be in this time frame that's forthcoming. Thrones. I just want to talk a little bit more about the thrones because, and, and I intended to have chapters 4 and 5 in one lesson because they are hand in glove chapters 4 and 5 
but I just couldn't because there was so much material there, so much need to talk in more depth about such things as the thrones, the elders, the beasts. But, but the, my main goal is try to convey a truthful, accurate picture of this throne and thrones as to authority and what is going to transpire when Christ is, comes out of the Holy of Holies in heaven and returns to the heavens above the earth to fulfill the, the justice arm of God in this new uh, authority of, of king and ruler. And so to understand that, I've delved in here a little deeper into thrones. Daniel 7, 9, uh, 7, 9 through 14, and then 26 and 27 with Revelation 4 and 5 gives us a pretty good picture of, of what's transpiring there. Hebrews 4, 14 says, Seeing we have a great high priest that has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. In the force of this words, it means he went right through and beyond the region of this world's created and inhabited realm of earth and heavens, went right through them and out into eternity. And the further word is scripturally Hebrews 7.26 where it says, Be he became higher than the heavens. That's a... That, that speaking both emblematically and practically. I mean, higher meaning in greater authority, e eternal existence as opposed to created existence. Uh, all, all of those things represent that word of the Spirit where it says, became higher than the heavens. He ascended far above all the heavens. That is, he went into the heaven outside and above all others created to that which is external in that eternal, that which was before the earth. You know, it was before the earth was ever here. And the created heavens under the Father's throne. You know, God, God created this out of things that were unseen. He, he, took, he took and formed the practical material world out of spiritual matter and created this place in time. It's not the, the Father's eternal home or eternal throne, although as the ancient of the days, he sits upon it, right? Why is he sitting on this? Why does Daniel say that it's ancient of days sit, sitting on this throne? Why isn't it Jesus Christ sitting on this throne? And why, why did John say it was God, the Father? There's two beings being, being presented here in the fourth and fifth chapter of Revelation. There's two beings, uh, the Father and the Son. Why is it that on this throne, this tribunal throne, why is it that it is the Ancient of Days? Why is it God? Well, I was able to ferret out at least two reasons. One, the throne has the old covenant connotations pointing us towards the memorial of Noah's covenant as the almighty creator and having previously judged and condemned by the flood depicted in the sea, the entire earth uh, the, the, uh, he, he condemned the world by the sea, the flood. And the entire world was destroyed by the flood. All life that had breath in their lungs was taken out of, of the earth. And so it was, if you'll remember, that God had a covenant with Noah. I believe it's the 19th chapter of... Uh, I think it's the 19th chapter of, of Genesis. But nonetheless... What I'm suggesting to you is that this throne that John sees depicts a rainbow around it. 
This is representative of, of the Noadic covenant. It is a, the sea out in front of it is represents also, among other things, it represents the sea that that the water that destroyed the earth in Noah's time. So the, this vision, as I said, ties together the old covenant with the new covenant. It ties together the ancient of days, the Almighty God, the Creator with that that has transpired here henceforth, before. You know, everything that happened up to this vision, actual fulfillment has been, has the Father dealing with the old covenant people and the earth. I'll have to get into that to explain what I'm saying there. But what I'm saying to you is that this vision that John sees ties the creator God back to the Noahic covenant, which also uh, lays the groundwork and for what's about to happen at this procession when Christ is going to receive from the Ancient of Days. Going back to Daniel real quick. Daniel chapter 7, we can read what it says that I beheld till the thrones were cast down, the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. Uh, we can go back to that time frame, and we can see that... Uh, Verse 13, it says, 713, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Okay? Uh, that, we, that we see in chapter 5 of Revelation where Jesus Christ is the Lamb that approaches the Ancient of Days, and the Ancient of Days gives him the book with the seven seals. So what you have is the depiction of Daniel here. You see the exact same thing in that you see that what's preparatory here to what God is doing is, number one is that he is tying the Old Covenant to himself in the Noetic Covenant, and then he's now going in number two, the Father... Uh, is, is formally, he's formally going to bestow on Jesus Christ's investiture. Investiture is the right word uh, that I use. It is, it is investiture means that it is the uh, formal, official granting of somebody the title and order and honor that had already been previously granted him. So he has been, he has, Christ has been Pronounce King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the righteous one, the true witness, the justice arm of God, and the judge of all things. He's been declared all those things by the Father. But the, what I'm doing to you is answering you why it is that it is the Ancient of Days and God that's sitting on this throne. One is that he ties himself to the Old Covenant by the visions and the typical uh, emblematic things that are accompanying this vision. And two is that he is about to, in, to grant unto Jesus his investiture. In other words, he is formally going to present unto him the authority to do what it is that is going to be done in the vengeance of God, the justice of God in the seven-year period, the, that of giving him, granting him that authority that he gave him in John chapter 5 in that the Father has given me all judgment and I, I will judge all men, all things. He is a formally giving it to him here, and that's what's preparatory here, what John is seeing. And in the fifth chapter of Revelation next week, we'll see the actual investiture wherein Jesus takes the, the book with the seven seals, and now he, with that, he has, he has taken the authority that was granted to him 2,000 years before at his coronation. Are you with me? 
And it's, as you see there in Daniel, in whatever verse that was, I read 20, whatever it was, 19, whatever it was, it's the same exact verse that you could flip over and read a similar kind of thing, but you'll remember it. It's the Lamb. Who is worthy, they cry. Who is worthy? And it's the Lamb's the only one that could, and that was Jesus Christ. So we'll see that next week. But for this week, I'm trying to explain to you the, the, the significance of this throne, who's sitting on it, why he's sitting on it, and what's going to happen. And why, why is there these 24 elders around it, and why is there these four cherubim around this tribunal, this movable, portable tribunal? Those are the things I'd like to do my best, even though I'm stumbly bumbling along here, I'd like to do my best to conveying I think it's critical that we understand what this throne is about, uh, what, where it's at, that it's not in the eternal heavens and God's throne. It's the tribunal throne Ezekiel saw, Isaiah saw, and others. That, that's significant to, to establish this in our hearts so when we're moving forward, the rest of the scriptures will unfold clearly. If we confuse this, I think we'll probably be confused uh, as we move forward. So the eternal, the heaven outside and above that's uncreated, that, that's eternal and external, that what was created that was not created, but was before the earth and the created heavens, is where the Father's throne in reality is. It's where, it's where Jesus and the Father are now. They're not sitting on this throne of justice. They're not administrating from this throne of justice. It is in the future to be set up. And we see that both in Daniel... It was to be set up in the future, and John sees it thousands of years later, and now we see it thousands of years later. I don't know how far it was from Daniel to John. It wasn't thousands of years later, but it has been 2,000 years since John saw it, and it still has not been set up. So it is here that the Father formally bestows Jesus Christ's investiture. It is the throne of justice, a movable throne set up in the heavens associated with and above the earth for the purpose of judging creation's world. It's for the purpose of judging creation world. There's no judgment coming down in the eternal, is there? For the prayer was that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So there's no need for judgment in the eternal. That where God resides and has always and where Christ is now at the right hand of the Father needs no judgment. So the, the judgment comes to the heavens and the earth, for that is where fallen creation is. So it's not, this is not the throne of God in heaven. I think it's clear, but I don't think that expositors have brought it out. I don't think that they have recognized it. To them, this vision is John looking into the heaven of heavens, the eternal place, and seeing the throne of God. Not, not that John didn't see into the heaven of heavens, the eternal heavens, but this, this throne that he's seeing is not in the heaven of heavens. So I said... It is the throne of justice, a movable throne. It's associated with the earth for the purpose of judging creation's world, fallen creation's world. It will be Christ's temporal throne from where he will judge and rule over this earth world in the millennial age of justice. You know, it's called the age of justice, the age of justice and judgment. So it is from a similar throne, if, if not this throne, that he will rule and reign from in the heavenly realm. In my mind, he'll rule and reign exactly from where it is that he returns to when he comes in the first coming. The first, not, I don't mean the first coming of the last days. There's two comings. There's the coming to the heavens above and then there's coming to the earth below where when all eyes will see him, his feet will touch down, etc. 
But the first coming is, I think, called as parousia, which is into the heavens. I believe that this is where it is that he actually will establish his kingdom from. I believe it is the actual kingdom from where Satan now rules and reigns in the heavens above the earth. It is to there that this throne is coming. It is a frightening moment for the spiritual realm, the darkened spiritual realm, when they see the cherubim and the elders approaching. This is the counsel of God. God has chosen counsel. He has count. It's not counselors. It's counsel. You know the difference between a counselor and a counsel. <laughs> it's a counsel. It's and he has these four uh, cherubim in the ca inner council. He has, of course, uh, the Holy Spirit, which is represented in the torches, right? And then he has Jesus Christ, which is in the next chapter represented in the Lamb. And he has the 24 elders. And we'll speak in terms of the elders and the living ones, the four cherubim, here in a minute. But the point is, is that this is his full council. This is his inner circle. This is where he goes. He takes these with him. These are the closest, the most senior, the most intimate with God. Right here. He has myriads, right? 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, Carl read. But this is his inner circle, and this is what is represented here. It's the same type of, of, uh, of, of Israel typing, of Israel practicing, of Israel being instructed by David in this in his worship and in his ruling in the Levite parties, there's the 24, the elder, the 24 uh, units that were still in function at the time of Jesus Christ from the time of David. They're represented right here. Uh, the, the, the thought and the thinking of, of elders, it comes from this place, from the heavenly mind, not from the man's mind. It came from the Spirit of God to David. So this, this was, as everything is, a spiritual first, right? The future <coughs> glory-filled period of time that we're, we're seeing is following this throne of justice. When, when Christ pours out the vengeance of God, the justice of God, and on all of those entities that I mentioned earlier, when he does that, men will rule, not angels. These, the thrones will no longer be, the thrones and crowns will no longer be those of these elder angels, but they will be redistributed to God's faithful new creation man. Angels have no part in the ruling uh, going forward in the new dispensation of God. Wherein they do now, they will not in the future. Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6 says, Angels will not rule with him as the court for angels will pass away. Hebrews chapter 2, 5. We won't read all the verses or scriptures, but let's read at least a few to get the flavor of the word of God as it relates to these angels. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 5 says, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. It's pretty clear that the angels are not to be a part of the ruling party of the, the earth and the heavens above the earth in the future. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3 tells us that men will even judge angels. Of course, it's not, not faithful angels that they will judge. So, the, And this also, when we read here a little deeper in Revelation chapter 4, beyond where Carl read, we have verse 10 says the four and twenty elders fall down before him and sat on the throne 
before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. So we, we have the picture of these elders here in this vision with thrones and crowns and they, in the vision, throw their crowns, cast their crowns at the feet of the Ancient One on the throne. That's the obvious meaning of these angels casting down their crowns is the, is the, uh, the giving up of their authority to rule and reign in the earth. Revelation chapter 4, verse 10. That's the first, there's, it, is also, it comes again in the chapter 5, but we're, we're trying to focus just on chapter 4 today. And it's at the feet of the ancient one, the holy one, they cast their crowns in this chapter. In the next chapter, they cast their crowns at the feet of the lamb and worship him. So what, what's the significance of that? I think it's fairly obvious, given the other verses and scriptures and other accounts in the Word of God, including Revelation 24 through 6, and then, and then not any further mention of the angels ruling in the, in the eternity that's coming in the new kingdom and new age. So that's the, that's the reality here. There's going to be a replacement of, of these angels that are on these thrones, the elder angels that are on these thrones with, with men faithful unto God, unto Christ. And martyrs will have thrones. Read it in the 20th, 4th, uh, 4th verse, uh, chapter Revelation, and we'll see that also you remember Christ promised the, the disciples 12 thrones, uh, that they'll rule with Christ on 12 thrones over all the tribes of, uh, over each tribe of Israel. So we see precedence there that there are these thrones. And by the way, there's a couple of different words for thrones and uh, crowns. And if you get, really want to get into it deep to see the significance of those, the meaning of these crowns. But let it suffice that we understand that it is a dynamic that God has intended from the beginning uh, to bring to pass. This is a mystery. These are mysteries that God is revealing uh, not only uh, uh, to his prophets, but to all of creation is, is uh, waiting in anticipation to see what it is, what is the meaning be behind God, God's adoption of sons, meaning human beings. What, what, is it, what does this mean? What is the significance? What's the impact What's going to happen to, to us? Uh, let's, let's watch. And amazingly, this, these things unfold not only to, to us, but to all creation. Ephesians chapter 3, 10 speaks in terms of the, the manifold wisdom of God being re revealed to the principalities and powers of, of the world. Yes, Debbie? Well, the, the word doesn't give us the, the insight there. We do see the 12 gates, and then we see the 12 foundations, uh, the apostles and the disciples. And so we know that there's 12 and 12 there, and that's obviously 24, and 12 is perfection in government. So uh, three times 12 would be perfect. So we don't know that the, that the 24 don't represent, weren't, didn't represent 36 because one-third of the angels fell, right? So one-third of the angels fell, and what was represented here now is 24, but it, what could have been most likely was 36. 
So who are those elders and will they replace them one, one for one? Or how it is that these thrones are going to be distributed in the new dispensation and the new government agencies will, will be done will, will be significantly different than it is now. We do know from the promises of Christ to his believers, his faithful ones, that some will have rulership over five cities. Some will have rulership over ten cities. So does that mean they are a part of his inner circle? I think not. I think the inner circle we know are the disciples and the apostles, and then those other chosen ones as God uh, uh, finds worthy. But then as the angels have the archangels, and as the, there are the elders' angels, there are the myriads of soldier and messenger angels. And so maybe it is that I, I would hope that I would be at least a... A, 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 a relative of, a rela in relation to, representative of a messenger angel and have some authority over a, over a principality or a dominion. Colossians chapter 1 speaks in terms of God, Christ having all authority over principalities, powers, dominions. And then Ephesians 6 having, having broken down the hierarchy of the satanic kingdom having principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness, this world and wicked spirits. All of those speak to the governmental, the, the sophisticated governmental regimen of the spiritual realm and how it is that these, these elders now are replaced in a, and now the new dispensation is administered, the government is administered by men, new, not just men, but new creation men, new nation men, faithful, uh, faithful followers and overcomers of Jesus Christ, how they will fit into that system is not a whole lot of it's been revealed, but what has is, is, is exciting and interesting to know that, that, uh, that even there will be a somewhat similar uh, government uh, administration as there was by the angels uh, represented here by the elders. But we remember that in this age, in this time, that the elders rule and reign in evil, wicked times, wherein the new dispensation, the, the new man and Christ rule and reign in the age of justice and eternal uh, bliss and peace and happiness. So that's a big, that's a big difference in itself. You know, there's one thing to administer in the, this realm, and there's another to administer in this realm. So those things are a little foggy to me, but I haven't spent a lot of time, a lot of time uh, meditating on them, thinking about them. I don't know if I've ever read anything on those times, ever. But they're, they're here, and they're clear, and I'm bringing out just enough so we can get the groundwork of what is transpiring here. Again, we're seeing... What we're seeing here is very significant in the setting of the throne. And the setting of this throne is significant throughout the remainder of the 18 chapters before us, counting this chapter. The, this throne is, is significant in that it is the investiture of Christ's authority on the throne that, that we're, we're looking to and reading the meaning and the significance into uh, to understand the rest of the, the book, the book of prophecy. And so understanding the dynamic of what these elders represent in the inner circle and who they are, for most of Christians believe they are 24 elders of men. They think they're men, which is, you know, contrary for seven or eight or ten reasons to the scriptures of God, which I do not care to get into right now, but maybe I will as we move forward. Plenty of good reasons to understand. Number one is they right now have crowns. You know, they have crowns. And uh, men, men have not crowns yet. They have thrones. Men do not have yet thrones. Anyway, there's lots of reasons to know that it's contradictory to think that these elders are men, but uh, it doesn't take very much uh, of reading scripture to understand that they are the angels of God, angels of God, as opposed to angels of the Lamb. Yes? Unless you read it, I think it's chapter 5, 
5, it says that the cherubim and the four creatures and the 24 elders bring the, um, the incense, the prayers of the saints. Mm -hmm. So it can't be men. Yeah, that's exactly right. Men wouldn't be bringing the, in, the prayers of men. Uh, there's, there's reasons after reasons why these are not, uh, and I didn't even talk to that, did I? I just assumed you knew, and I'll continue to assume that. Uh, these elders are angels, and they will have no place in ruling and reigning in the new dispensation, the kingdom coming. Verse 4, the elders are angel rulers and are the heads of angels. They have thrones and they have crowns. There are 24 of them, the pattern of which is found in David's organization of temple worship, which here furthers, furthers the intent to tie the investiture also to the old covenant understandings. Their functions are administrative. They are chief in the heavenlies in the highly sophisticated system of government. These ruling angels direct messenger angels upon God's directives in the earthly realm. Some are soldier-like, and they do battle. Revelation 12, 7, and Daniel 4, 35. The Lord is referred to in Scripture as the Lord of hosts many times. The Lord of hosts. Many angels rebelled, along with their leader Satan, Ezekiel chapter 28, and are relegated to this world. They, are, they don't have free course into the heavens. They have, Satan has no right into, into this inner circle or counsel of God. You remember in Job chapter 1, it appeared that he had rights to appear before God as these others did in the counsel of, of God. Do you remember? But after the Lord has defeated him, he has no longer access in that same way as he had before. So he's relegated to this heaven, these heavens, and this world. This does not mean that he does not communicate with those that are in heaven, in eternal heaven. He does have communicate. There is interaction, but he certainly doesn't have access into this inner council, inner circle, or the throne of God. Neither will he have in this one, nor does he have in the one throne of God in the heavens, the heaven of heavens. Yeah. Quick question. I want to derail you uh, just to guess or no. Do you think that you can, through means of meditation or drugs, enter into the first heaven when Satan's wrong as a human, as a man? Do I think so? Yeah. Scripture. I think Scripture, uh, scripture shows us that <clears throat> you can have this interaction uh, with, with demons. Uh, yeah, at, what John, if you'll remember here in John, it was in the spirit that he found himself on the Lord's day. And it's in the spirit that many of these things happen, not in the body. At times, like with the visions of, of Paul in uh, the 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians, he didn't know whether he was in the body or out of the body. But here... John knew that he was in the spirit. He, he, he was not accompanied by his body. When he was said, come up hither, it wasn't with body that he came. He came in spirit. In other words, his, his being left his carnal body, whatever that uh, consists of. Uh, to me, it's both the spirit, the organ of God, and the soul, the living soul of man, leaving the encasement of the body, and then leaving uh, enough life in it that, it that it allows the body to live. It's the spiritual umbilical cord. But this allows a man to leave his body. That the, uh, the clear evidence of that is found in multitude of scriptures in the Bible. So back to your question, can a man leave his body uh, and, and can he communicate in the heavens with, with satanic forces? Yes. It's been proven over and over. Uh, there's religions that are on the earth that are based strictly and entirely on astral travel, which is just a matter of 
through drug inducement or meditation that they they leave their through witchcraft they leave their bodies and they communicate with the spiritual realm uh, and that of course would only be the realm of Satan for it is it is an ordinance of God a commandment of God that such things not be done so it's not something that you do to to communicate with God it's contrary to God and there's many in many uh, deceptions that have been wrought and many false gods and many false religions have been established through such type communications from the times pharaohs magicians and preceding that from I suppose Babylon itself when there was this intercommunication the the, the myriad of different religions that have come and go including the Mayans who were transported through their on and on it's it's all out there and it's yes it's real and and I would say that any one of us could explore and communicate uh, the, any of those avenues if we had a will to choice or desire to do so. I guess, right. I guess my clarification would be that I believe that too. It's one of the devil's, uh, as some would say, doubters or whatever would say, it's all in your mind. Yeah. Uh, it's a mental trance like. Yeah. Well, all that someone who says that says is that they've never did it. <laughs> That's all it says, and they don't believe the... I can tell you the, how many uh, on this face of this earth that experience these things all the time. So it doesn't matter whether someone thinks it's in the mind or not. It's not... It's a reality. Uh, Bella's shaking her head because she knows there's much of that kind of things from her father's homeland that that's that's practiced a part of the religion leaving your body and and I've, I've known people of myself that have witnessed to me the the realities of that in that they have actually left their bodies and went somewhere and watched somebody and were able to come back and tell every minute detail of what went at, happened over there after that they had went there in the spirit. Remote scene, yeah, I, I know some people too. And I, so, just, I, I just always heard that it's a, there's an argument between it's all in your mind and it's a really unconscious state. And I just wondered if that was a spiritual thing that they were saying. Well, you know, the, the Nephilim didn't come from the mental mind. No. No, he has access to us. It's just the reason to me that you could actually access that. But a believer's not supposed to try to pursue that. No, no. Okay. No, that, that's where many of get off into mysticism, spiritualism, which is a, is a very big movement in the world today. It has been for 100 years. Since the early 1900s, spiritualism is alive and cooking out there. I mean, there are so many things that are going on out there that would shock and surprise us as to what's happening right now. Just as the prophet was shocked when Ezekiel, when God take, took him into the temple to show him what was going on in there. He was shocked. It is, it is a sign of the times, the drugs and mysticism and spiritualism is a sign of the end times. It's, it's prophesied. Kathy? I mean, there are street drugs right now where you can take them and do out-of-body experiences with them. They're right here on the street here yeah. in this country. And so it, it's not just a message about the world, but what Mike's saying is true about the, about the uh, worship of demons and uh, the religions that has gone back since the beginning of time. But I think the thing that scares me the most is that these drugs are so easily gotten by young people. Yeah, it's great. There's great many pitfalls there. It's just a, a grand, grave warning to, to all. Don't, don't play, don't play with it. No, and I know for a fact from people I know the knowledge of that puffs you up. 
Well, yeah, they have something. They have something you don't have, and of course, there's always the spirit of pride, isn't it? Uh, anyway, it's okay. It's okay because these, when you start seeing the realities of the spiritual realm, then these natural questions come about. Uh, when you know you're really painting a good uh, vision of what's on the other side of where we're at in eternity when when people start thinking in those kinds of terms uh, it's it's frightening it's nothing new i mean i'm how old am i i'm 67 i think or 68 i'm right in there but i'm a 60s boy you know so you know i this is nothing new it was all introduced into our culture when we were young teenagers is is a, a vast majority of the things that we're seeing today, although it's exponential, uh, were, were things from back then at that age and time, which came mainly from drugs, mainly from, and mainly from Vietnam. Yeah. Vietnam, uh, you know, that's, that's where most of these, these things kind of, up to the 60s, before the Vietnam War, there was, we were kind of a closed society as it relates to those kinds of hallucinatory types of drugs, of laws and so forth. But over there, it was so practiced and so prominent that our, our soldiers, uh, all of them, were in, uh, well, a good share of them, a great deal of them, experienced these sort of things. Can we move on? I just will expand on that a little bit. Uh, I was saying that many of the angels rebelled before uh, in Ezekiel chapter 28, we see Satan, Lucifer, uh, as, as the full of pride and, and first fallen among the angels. And he was a cherubim, a cherub, uh, which gives, gives me thought that, that adds credence to the 24 and the 36 that we were earlier talking about because there was more than four because... Satan was one. Uh, they are now relegated to this world, principally in the first heaven, where they are known as principalities, uh, which word indicates there are certain ones that rule over areas or territories, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places, Ephesians chapter 6. But another scripture that expands our thinking with the addition of the Colossians one, is Colossians 1.16, for by him... Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven. And that though in the King James, it says heaven. And, and again, it's, it's plural. It should be heavens because it's relating uh, things created. And, and uh, uh, you know, heaven itself was not created. Where, where God is is not, uh, not a created place. It's eternal. And the, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, where the you know, there you go, visible and invisible. There are things on earth that are invisible, according to Paul, right? Of course there are. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And we'll note in the, in the prayer that's offered up by the beasts and the elders, verse 9, Revelation 4, 9, and when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. And then the verse 10, the four and 20 elders fall down before him and that sat on the throne and worship him. They worship, whereas the four living creatures give honor and glory and thanks. They, the 24 elders, worship him that live forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. So we see that, that Colossians 1, they're repeated by, not by man, by Paul, but, but by the angels, by the elders' angels, recognizing that they are creation and that God is the creator in giving him honor and power and glory. And not only that, and praise, but not only that, but worship. And I just think that there's a big significant difference between praise and worship. I'm not sure exactly how to define it, but 
worship is about as deep as you can go as a being as it relates to your adoration, expression of adoration to God. And these elders were, were proficient at it. Verse, verse 4, I already started on that, didn't I? Uh, so I'm on page 3, and it said down to where it says possibly, the next last paragraph, possibly uh, these, these elders are the chief princes of Daniel 10.13. Um, and I'll read that real quickly for you in case you're not very familiar with that scripture. Daniel 10, 13. It says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. Do you remember that? But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. I'm just, it's that the, I'm not told this, I can't find it in Scripture per se, but I'm just wondering if this reference to chief princes here in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, isn't a reference to these 24 elders. That, that in my mind, I think that they're one and the same, the chief princes and these 24 elders, and Michael being one of them. Uh, his name, Michael, means who like El? Who like El or like El? Inferring closeness to God. And, and, and there's no other angels closer to God uh, than, than the 24 elders. So I w I'm just suggesting to you that if potentially, possibly, the chief princes are that, uh, da of Daniel 10... In other words, there's this, this, there's this uh, structure of, of dominions and powers and principalities that, uh, that are, have uh, certain authorities. And when the messenger angel uh, uh, for, w was given a message that came from God to an elder, to a messenger angel, when that messenger angel there in the 10th chapter of Daniel was resisted, he couldn't, in his own authority, couldn't resist the powers of darkness. And, and for 21 days, they withstood him to not be able to deliver the message that God had given the elders to give to Daniel. But when the angel could not himself, he appealed again to the inner circle to these elders, what he calls chief princes, and Michael himself came and brought the message, had the power and authority to break through whatever uh, line of, I'll call them defenses, but they're, lot, they're offenses really, uh, uh, that, that Satan had set up around Daniel in his prayers. The scene before us in Revelation 4 and 5 is reflective of Daniel 7, that of adoring inner circle of God, priest-like in nature. They worship, and they're dressed in white. White is the, is the, white is the garment of righteousness. And they, never having been fallen, is, have no need of blood to approach Christ, or approach the Father, right? They have no need of blood. They have never fallen. They've never sinned. So they're in white. They're dressed in white. Satan's not dressed in white, <laughs> but these are dressed in white, and it's priestly. So they're priestly, but not only are they priestly, they're kingly, right? As they have crowns, and they have thrones, so then they have dominion. And a kingdom means to have a king, and a priest means to have a, a, be a mediator. So these elders, the angelic elders, stand in the off, off, office of priest kings, thus adding more merit to that new structure dispensation, new dispensation structure of Christ calling men to be kings and priests. They are the actual taking the place in the administration of God's government in the earth and in the heavenlies in that kingly, priestly ministry 
similar to that that these elders, angels have as we speak right now. As we speak right now, they are, they are administrating God's directives in the earth by, through God. They are sitting around him, uh, assembled around him, sitting on his judgment throne. All the angels are in attendance, the number being the same in both book accounts. What Carl read was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. He is about <clears throat> to officially inaugurate the new eternal order. So, so it's the very same scene. The number is exactly the same in Daniel as it is here in Revelation chapter 4. The scene is, is God is about to, to grant, give, confer the investiture of authority to rule, reign, and bring vengeance and justice to all those entities, those four entities I earlier mentioned, all in the earthly realm to Jesus Christ. That's the scene. That's what's getting ready to happen. We're going to see it happen in the next chapter, but this is, this is a prelude to that, that we might understand it clearly and that it, what its significance is. The matter before us is divinely governmental. God Almighty state is kingly. He's in splendid display as heaven's subjects are in expectant and worshipful attendance. These thousands and 10,000 times 10,000, all of these are in, in attendance. It is a happening. It's a spiritual happening in the future. Verse 10 and 11, angels have been the rulers during these wicked ages. Daniel chapter 7 is our Old Covenant witness that during the future ages, rulership will be by men. That's where I said that the authority and dominion was given to the people of the Most High. That's the terminology that Daniel used. The elders, these 24 elders, are acutely aware of the history of man. Right? They, they've I mean, we read, they live, right? We read about it, they lived it. They li live from, from the garden till now. Each one of them has a memory bank that has all of the things that have transpired up to now. They have some foreknowledge, even though it's, they do not have the specifics, nor know the full plan of God because it's not yet all been revealed but they have foreknowledge of the Word of God and they have a better view than we have. So they are acutely aware of what is transpiring or, or using Texas terms, fixing to transpire right here. They, they know it and it's significant. Uh, they have that history of man, the Lamb of God, his victory over Satan, death and grave of Hades for the purposes of God who is now close to the door on the age of mercy and grace, is closing now the door on the age of mercy and grace and opening the book which includes the tribulation, justice, and judgments to be pronounced. These, having ever been faithful angels, true fidelity is now under great test. You know, I, I, being a human and very finite mind and more finite than most, I have difficulty in grasping how that the future can be seen in such vivid color without it having happened. I, I have a difficulty, I have difficulty in grasping that. Then how is it that free will is involved? How is it that, that, it, that it doesn't, if free will is involved, how is it that it doesn't, how is it that it comes off just as it is foretold? These are things that are hard for me to understand, but nevertheless, these angels, these good, faithful angels that have been from, from the get-go of creation of man and saw all of our history, know what it is that the Son of God has done, which was a great mystery, but it came about and God gave the order in Hebrews chapter 1 to worship Jesus Christ and they did. It is, a, it is a wonder to me 
that that they are being so their fidelity is being so tested here. In other words, they're going to lose they're going to lose what it is that they have. Uh, at least as it relates to authority, ministry, mission, that that they've had for however long, thousands of years, that dispensation is changing. And they're going to be faced with it right here. Their crowns, their authority uh, is going away. How, how do they receive that? And an inferior inferior is taking their place in God's new dispensation governmental order. <laughs> how do they receive that? Well, we know that they could receive it in a negative way because Satan received things that were of less insult than that and rebelled against God. In other words, it, it, potentially these angels, uh, these 24 elders in particular, could are being tested. That, that to me is, is an amazing dynamic here. Potentially, but the, the scripture doesn't give us, give us that insight, but scripture does give us an insight, I think. I think it was the Spirit of the Lord that gave me this, I hope, was the Spirit of the Lord. My, my mind went to the elder son. You know, the elder son, the prodigal son, and the elder son. Look at Luke 15. Look at that real quick, and we'll read it real quick. As it relates to the elder's uh, in this er, inner circle. Luke fe chapter 15, verse 24, uh, gives us the story at the end. For uh, this my son was dead. This is the father speaking. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now the elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew, in other words, he was doing his job, right? He was, he was working. He was doing what he was told to do. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked them what these things meant. And he said unto them, Thy brother has come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. See, this is, this is I could see as the attitude of an angel. Uh, lo, these many years do I serve thee faithfully. I've neither trans transgressed. None of these angels have ever done any transgressing. I at any time uh, of any of thy commandments, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as thy, thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with horrors, thou, and this could be said about mankind, couldn't it? Uh, but as soon as thy son was come, which has devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, and I can see this, the Lord saying this, the Almighty God saying to his angels, Thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. What an encouraging, wonderful word. Well, I would throw my crown at his feet in a moment right then too. <laughs> all that I have is, you, you are faithful, and you are my son, and all that I have is yours. Man, that's all I needed to hear. Here's my crown. Give it to your other son. I, I have you. I have your assurance that I'm in good stead with you. And that's what I think these angels stand on. They, these, these, these elders, they stand on that, the goodness of God. And they, get, they throw the crowns of feet, and they know what's happening. It's not like it's a snuck up on them. They know what's about to happen. This investiture is about to happen. It's already known to them that they're going to give up their crowns, and they willingly, God didn't come over and ask them for them. He didn't knock them off their heads. They came over willingly, casting at his feet quickly, acknowledging God Almighty, the Creator, as that party that is worthy to take their crowns and, and have the assurance that they have, have still that place with him. I was going to say a word or two about the rainbow. I don't know why I didn't. I was going to say a word or two about the, the sea. I don't know why I didn't, but 
now I see what I'm, time it is. Well, I'm need to move on. To, we're almost finished. What would you say about the rainbow? Uh, Curtis, um, the rainbow. It's so perverted now. So. Yeah, I never thought of that. The, the rainbow is, is a memorial before God that in his judgment that he might f also remember that he would not destroy the earth by flood, right? Again. So you'll note that in all the plagues that are coming, there is no flood. <laughs> it is always a memorial f to him. And that th also this throne with that memorial around it and the sea in front of it ties this almighty creator back to the old covenant the Old Testament with Israel, remembering, yeah, you know, I was the God, and I've, I think I say it in this, I was the God of Noah, and I am the God of Jesus, and I'm the God of Israel. So it is, the rainbow is a reflective of those, uh, those thoughts. They bring into our view uh, the old covenant that God has not forgotten Israel. Matter of fact, this is all about Israel. The bride has been the bride has been caught up, at least the, the, uh, the uh, first fruits of, 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 it ha of that offering bride has been caught up. Jesus is now, the end of the time of Gentiles is here. Now the focus changes and it moves to Israel. And the, the rainbow and the sea represent, I have not forgotten. I, ha I have memorialized it before me and Israel, the seed, of Noah, the seed of Shem, the seed of Abraham, there before me, and I will again address them. In other words, I haven't annulled that covenant. The Noahic covenant is not gone. It's not gone away. The Abrahamic covenant is not gone. It's not gone away. He's still, the promises and the significant historical meanings of them are still carrying on and will be fulfilled in this seven-year period in the age of justice in this throne of justice in, involved in that breaking of those seals has to do with Israel. Matter of fact, I just say this. I believe that book that is covered with the seven seals is the new covenant to Israel. It has all of the significant points of fact that bring about Israel's gospel redemption again from death unto life. But we'll talk about that in the future. But that's some of the things that I said in regard to the rainbow. Verse 10, 11, angels live in the rules during this wicked ages, right? Oh, verse 6, 9, the four beasts, the living ones. The, the Greek word, the four beasts, it's a, a really bad uh, translation, really, word into English. It's actually in the Greek, zoon, which means living ones. Quite different from therion, which is the, the wild beast, of Revelation 6, 8, and 11, 7. These are just simply living ones, and we can see they are cherubim. Uh, cherubim, the root word is hard to find. Uh, it's hard to discover. The closest thing I could find was that it potentially means the great ones. Not simply angels, then. Uh, they're cherubim. The elders are heads of angels, and the cherubims are, the, it appears to me, the cherubim are the heads of the four earthly created creatures. We have, I don't have time to go into all of the uh, different uh, types that we can easily glean out of the Old Covenant as it relates to the cherubim and, their, and the, to their appearance. But you remember their appearance, right? They, are, they are, have four uh, faces. Uh, they have the heads of four different and have faces of the four uh, earthy created creatures. They are mentioned in Genesis 3.24. Remember, that's the cherubim that uh, guarded the gates uh, back into the garden with a flaming sword. Uh, that's significant, uh, meaning, I think, that because they're representative of uh, the, the, we'll call them the tribes or the creatures of the earth, they're representative of them. As the elders are the representatives of the angels, the cherubim are the representatives of the four created classes or creatures of, that God has created, that being the man, the lion, the ox, and the eagle. So 
uh, that the, the picture of them uh, in Ezekiel chapter 1, 10, 20 something, 40 something, those pictures of the cherubim in the old covenant, I don't know how many times it was uh, Exodus 25, 18. Uh, Hebrews 9, 5 mentions them, and then seven times they're mentioned in this book of Revelation. Those cherubim are, are, are always depicted in the same manner that they have these four faces. And the only difference is that there's uh, here and six wings and they're four winged in, uh, in Ezekiel. That's the only significant difference. And I venture not down that road as to why. I don't know. God has not told me. And as far as I know, I don't know any way that does know. Why in Ezekiel's vision, they have four, the cherubim have four wings, and they, they're doing the same job as what these sixth wing cherubim are doing in, in Ezekiel 1, as they are doing in John chapter 4. And so it's a perfect type and a perfect example of the same uh, investiture of Jesus Christ, authority. But when one has four wings, one, one says they have four, and one says they have six. Okay, but I don't venture down there, even though I have some opinions, but I, I don't care to express them because, I mean, expositors haven't figured it out. I don't know how I'm supposed to figure it out. Uh, the, head, the elders, the heads, I know how I'm supposed to. I just haven't got the capacity that, or, or the will. The elders are heads of angels, and the cherubim are the heads of the four earthly created creatures. Uh, these four, these four six-winged cherubim are in closer than the elders. It says, as you read, Carl, no, you didn't read it, but I will. Revelation chapter 4, my Bible, I'll just fall open to that. Um, says, as it relates to the uh, uh, beast, uh, verse 6, and before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne. See, they're not surrounding around the throne like, like the 24 elders, but these are in the midst of the throne, and around about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. You know, eyes everywhere. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the, or cattle, or an ox. And the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy and holy and holy, Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down. So these, these creatures, these living creatures that are around uh, in the midst of the throne, uh, they're, they're praise givers, that we can see, and being nearer to the throne than any other created being in heaven, uh, which is Revelation 4, 8, and 8 through 11, and 14. These are the cherubims of Ezekiel's visions, chapter 126 and 10, 1, and 1122 and 43, 3 that appear to move, move the judgment throne of God from one place to another. They are representatives of earth's creation, having four faces of the chief orders of man, lion, ox, and eagle. I kind of take, take offense at that, and I don't know why. Do you? I take a little offense with that. And, I don't, I don't, and it's just pride. It's not right. But I don't like to be compared to an ox and an eagle. <laughs> huh? Yeah, the lion's in there. It's a little better. But you know what I'm saying. I mean, I'm just like I'm bunched up with them. I thought I was more significant. I thought I was something, you know. The reality, you know, that, that's just a natural inclination that it's not right in any way on any level. But, but that is the, these cherubim are representative of mankind, the beasts of the field, domestic animals, and birds. That's the clear picture in all the visions. Uh, the, someone might ask, why, didn't the, why isn't there no fish? Well, because the, there's no sea in the new earth. In the new earth and the new heaven, we'll read, and when we get there, in Revelation chapter 20, 21, and 22, there, were, there is no sea. So there's no representative in the cherubim for the fish. And then the reptiles... 
are not hard to figure out why there's no representation, is there? It was the serpent that conspired to induce sin into this world, and accordingly God enters into covenant with but three plus the man. And we can go there. Let's look at that, Genesis chapter 9, so you'll see um, in closing uh, what it is that I'm suggesting to you these cherubim are, as they are our representatives, as the elders are the representatives of the angels. Genesis 9, 9 and 10 says, And I behold, I establish my covenant with you, speaking to Noah after the flood, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. So we see that there, there are the four represented there again, not reptile, not fish, not those creeping things, but just man, ox, man, lion, ox, eagle. God had here, all the way back to Genesis 9, 9, and 10, has made covenant. Uh, and it make, then it makes more sense to me why it was that a cherubim was set at guard at the watch of the garden, because it was so significant. Had, had beast or man eaten of that tree of life, then they would have been in that condition that they were in forever. So that, that, that's what the word says, and it's it, that shows the significance of why it was a cherubim as representative of before God in his inner council circle, the cherubim, uh, to set a cherubim at the gate, at the guard, as, as opposed to an angel uh, elder. Are you with me? Does that make any sense to you? Seems to make sense to me. The cherubim tie the covenants together. God is the God of the Adamic, the Noatic, the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, the gospel of the new man with, with now starting in chapters 4 and 5, the gospel of the revelation of Jesus Christ to Israel revealed in the book of Revelation. Uh, I actually had written as much inside this on chapter 5. So we'd now just be starting chapter 5. So I think it was a good decision that I just stuck with chapter 4. But as I said, chapter 4 and chapter 5 are, go together in, in time, in the future. You know, there's some, uh, what's the right word? Uh, parenthetical insertions, right? Into the uh, book of Revelation. There will be things that will be parenthetically inserted that are not in chronological order. That are explanation of things that, that, that are things thereafter, but not particularly in the order that they chronologically happen. So you, so you have to have knowledge of these things, what goes with what time. But in chapters 4 and 5, there's no parenthetical insertion. It's chronologically in order. It is after the things that are that these things specific to chapters 4 and 5 happen together in unison. So when you come next week, you can please read chapter 4 and chapter 5. I'll review 4, tie it into chapter 5, and we'll move forward with the purposes that God intended to show John. Mm -hmm.